My name is Ed John. Uh, been well involved with treaty rights, governance of the reservation, uh, working with the coastal tribes and working with the tribes of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, going back to my grandfather who was uh, on tribal council for Quinault, Frank Law, and uh, one of his daughters, Marion, was a tribal secretary for years, and my uncle Bobby Law, and down to my cousin Jig Shale was treasurer, and, and uh, my brother Guy McMines. So a lot of um, my teachings come from there and uh, observations, as well as uh, fortunate to be raised with a good group of my age, Pearl Capoleman, uh Baller, who who uh, was our chairman for years, and my sister married up in Hoe River, was tribal chair at Hoe, and Howard Hudson, and then Howard's family, just strong traditional people. Um, couldn't have been around a better uh, place in a, at a better place in time with the closeness of uh, all the coastal communities and enduring um, through really tough times and then a period of time where uh, long came this uh, decision by the tribes to test the waters in the the bolt era the bolt decision and um, you know, a lot of people look at the Bolt decisions with mixed emotions, and uh, a lot of the tribes have the same because um, well, from the whole river point of view, I mean, it it really changed things for them because the influx of people and the co-management by the state and uh, the way things changed has really put a put them in a tough spot and a hardship from what they used to know was their life living on that small reservation and um, pretty much unnoticed and untouched. And all of a sudden all these regulations come in and they fish less and less and less and less. So it comes with that real mixed emotion, the, the impact for one tribe versus another, but what we do in the today's times is we stick we stick together, like through an organization of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Um, but back to uh, you know where I'm from in Tohola is that comes along with my grandmother uh, Ida Strom, um, and then she married my grandpa Frank Law. That's our our family comes from Ho River and uh, Clallam. That's where my grandpa was born. My grandmother was Ho River, and then we got our way to Tohola because they were asked to come. Uh, great grandpa was a blacksmith, and my gra grandmother was a midwife. And then the evolution of our family with the Cornaults has been long and uh, proud of who we are. Um, I look at this, what we're, the work we're doing right now that have to do with treaty rights at risk uh, that you mentioned is really developing into um, a, a position or a white paper that gets more lengthy because our treaty rights are continually being put at risk in all of our areas. Uh, think of a discussion that we had with the Port of Grace Harbor this past week with my tribal council and the Port of Grace Harbor wanting to talk about um, what they know as the permits that are in play and the potential for gas or gas and oil exports out of the, the Port of Grace Harbor. And that puts us at risk. Uh, looking at the number of uh, ship traffic that increases. And then you think about 
all of these train cars that are going to house, I don't know what they are, 10, 15, 20,000 gallons. Of, it's a, kind of a, I think it's a heavy crude that goes to the refineries. And it ends up being you know, 120 cars times five or ten per week. And then it just goes up from there, and every one of those is a risk of some kind of failure. And what, what I asked them and observed was, I understand all of the risk, but I don't see where the reward is. The port may have or get a reward through some kind of imposed offloading fee, and the company driving it in and driving it out makes some money. Um, the I think the proposed um, benefit to Grace Harbor is the number of jobs. And at some point, you you got to weigh all of those. But for our treaty rights, which is embedded in um, the Treaty 1855 and affirmed by the Supreme Court, says that we'd reserve those rights, and we are co-managers of that resource. So those fish, those clams, the crabs, the oysters, and Grace Harbor Bay, and going on up into the Chehalis, and everything out there in the ocean and on the shore, um, there's a tremendous amount of impact and impact potential. And we have a right to have a say in these kinds of activities. And um, we're, that's a serious question that the, the port development is looking at and that warrants us to take a good hard look at another case where our treaty rights are at risk. Well, I just want to uh, first say that the last time that I've uh, we uh, had share a mic was uh, when I had choked and uh, Paul Wagner here with me and we were cracking up, he said, because we're definitely doing a, uh, being ingen ingenuity. And uh, I don't know what was going on with the mics, but this is good. I, I've, um, I feel... Uh, uh, good about where, where we're at here and you're sharing but with the treaty rights and uh especially the trains going through and i was what i was reading is that the amount of uh dust and uh whatever's coming off the the trains going through all the the tribal territories it goes into the water and it affects uh the fish uh, especially the the salmon um and the clams and i uh i just was wondering if we could talk a little bit about about that and uh um, how, you know, it, it gets into like a, I'm not a real good at math, but I remember it was like in the, in the millions of some particles that go in and that affect and, uh, kind of morph the, the way that the fish changes gender, does all this stuff to it. Um, uh, it, it goes into, into us and our food. How, how does that, how does, how does that, does that play? Well, that, that is, um uh a subject that I guess is off the table in Grace Harbor, but is uh, on the table still at Cherry Point, which affects the Lummies and the Nooksacks and affects all of us in a, that are connected to um, um, a, a question like that and a situation like that. I, the, in fact, the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, its member tribes, its 20 member tribes, came out um, by resolution and vote, um, uh, I think the last meeting or perhaps the meeting before, in uh, support of the Lummies and, and Nooksacks and telling everyone that, that we would oppose that. And it is for those kinds of reasons, the, the issue of those coal cars coming out of Wyoming and Montana and the coal dust, unfortunately, the other facility is just a little north of of the Lummi in the West Shore in Canada, and uh, I've seen a couple of uh, documentaries of the communities living in and around that 
facility and uh, the the folks that are doing the activity claim one thing and then the visible evidence that you see in those homes as those uh, folks showed they go wash their windows off and the all the black would roll down the windows and you could pick it up on your finger and it's uh it's it's concerning uh, we know that it's being considered out on the Columbia River I know that uh, Columbia River tribes have come out in the, with positions on that um, we have had a little bit of discussion with them about uh, treaty rights at risk as in, that as applies to the things that are going on and impacting them so this this issue of um, coal is a is a big one in Indian country because it travels over so many Indian lands before it gets here and uh, we're we're staying and standing behind the uh, Lummies in the Nooksack up north with uh, their dealings with coal how is the um, the US government uh, are, are they being uh, cooperative or, or what's their position on um, with, you know, how they feel about that with the tribes well the I think the point there is no matter if it's United States government we're continually educating people some agencies they they do a pretty good job and they get it right and then some of the agencies are so large there's so many different divisions inside of them like NOAA um, that you have to continually educate folks about tribes and treaty rights and the fact that they um, have a fiduciary responsibility, a trust responsibility, and you oftentimes have to remind them through requests of a government-to-government -government consultation. And um, I don't think the tribes throughout Indian country will ever be able to um, be confident that you don't have to pay attention and that you sometimes you have to go the extra distance to educate these federal agencies and, and a lot of times we educate our our uh, state house and legislature and same way at the federal level that uh, what the treaties mean and the responsibility to the trust responsibility to the tribes and we have to we are always that's always on our mind and it's always one of the tasks that we have to do thankfully I mentioned before some of them understand it and get it and, and uh, we work in a very kind of a well-connected um, way that we avoid a lot of unnecessary meetings but when called for we, we have to do it yeah, um, you mentioned uh, the treaty rights, and uh, I was talking to you earlier a little bit about. Um, I know that Washington State, uh, there's a lot of people coming in um, every day, moving here, and uh, they need to understand what the treaty rights are, and that they are a law, and uh, how they affect the tribes, and how they could be a good steward as they're moving in here um, to uh, take it upon themselves to to learn about the, about the treaty rights and I just wanted to maybe get you to talk a little bit about what that the, the rights are and and uh, how p people could be better stewards as they're coming in and people that are still here that uh, don't have um, I, I meet people every day on the bus that believe it or not that uh, don't re don't realize their the tribes are still around and I constantly have to educate like you were saying because uh, I, I hear Billy in the back of my head you know all the time tell them the truth Tell them what's going on. Tell them we're still here, and this is what what you need to do. And so uh, I find myself talking a lot on the bus. Uh, the, these issues that we're talking about this evening. Well, boy, tribes are still around. Would have been great to have people come out to Squaxin Island last weekend and see the tribes that are still around because really a really a nice powwow from the coastal perspective, coastal jam to the next couple of days and couple of nights. We're, we're still around, and, and we're still telling our story. As Billy says, we've got to tell our story. And you bring up that subject of uh, a lot of people moving into the state of Washington is very concerning to us. And um, 
the treaty rights at risk, um, basically the, the paper position, white paper that we produced almost two years ago in July, was started really talking about the process of, of uh, recognizing that all the good work that the, st- the tribes do it, through coastal Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery monies and their own monies and grant monies and working in collaboration with uh, NGOs and, and a lot of times with communities and, and uh, putting our habitat back into place, it's also being given away at a faster rate that we're doing good things, but with all these people coming in and the the over-appropriation of water, uh, which means several things, one of which is withdrawals from these creeks and from these rivers and from their main stems for not only for human use, but for other uses like uh, in the farming and... Uh, dairy and so forth and in particular in eastern washington with with cattle seems like cattle have more water rights than than humans um it it's uh the foundation for our treaty rights at risk paper and and the fact that through permitting processes that federal government has a say in certainly states have a say in and counties and cities they're they're giving up our habitat. They're letting it be in, infringed upon, building in uh, critical areas, uh, not protecting wetlands like we should. Many things that that have made us realize that we were not able to keep up with the destruction of the habitat. So that puts our treaty right at risk. The second component of that is question is we're constantly back to that education piece that we have to do. We have to do as tribes do a better job of telling uh, uh, the rest of the citizens of the state who we are and what we stand for, what our rights are and what we do. And as individuals, we have to do that same con- uh, conversation like you mentioned on the bus. And we do it as organizations, um, Salmon Defense, Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Uh, some of the treaty councils do a lot of work. All the tribes do a lot of work. Uh, going, to, Yes, it, all these intertribal organizations, we have to... We have to continue to educate folks of who we are and what our rights are. And for us um, Bolt tribes, it's that uh, co-manager. We have a co-manager responsibility to these resources. And then we have, a you know, our partner, the United States, has some trust responsibility in here. And the other partner is the state of Washington. And that's the co-manager. And... The state of Washington has been um, under um, real bad fiscal restraints the last two or three bienniums, and um, they've cut, 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 and uh, almost everywhere where you might have some oversight or regulatory authority, less is not good. And uh, in the fish business that that I principally am in, uh, the management of, we see the impacts. Uh, when we do, we look at Grace Harbor, or we look at the Quinault or the Queets, Hump Tulip, Chehalis River, and the the works working uh, relationship with the state. It's we're asked to do more tribes continually do more with less. We pick up more of the data responsibility, pick up more of the science, um, because it's work that has has to be done. And you you always want to protect the integrity of your work because um, 
you don't want to guess. You want to be right. You want to protect those resources, and you you want to put um, good work together. Uh, you know, so you you uh, always mindful of the, these runs of salmon, as you mentioned earlier, seven generations out, or the song said earlier. We're always looking seven generations out. Sometimes we put together 100-year plans. Quinault has put together a 100-year plan of restoration of the upper Quinault because we're concerned about us, our sockeye run, our blueback. And you, took, you take that 18, 19 miles of river above the Quinault that through um, the turn of the last century on into now that you know, because of settlement, because they turned a lot of that ground into uh, grazing ground. All the trees were were uh, removed. There was logging, heavy logging up in there, and it took this big valley, and it the river was no longer stable. It, it switches back and forth, back and forth. And, the, and our study said that it, it requires help or it would never heal itself. You know, it's a 100-year plan. It's, you know, three or four hundred uh, man-made structures like engineered jams and other to stabilize and protect these habitat and side channels. A lot of people don't, they, they don't see a hundred-year plan. They don't understand a hundred-year plan. They, um, they, they just don't. They don't know how to look beyond just themselves. Where we look beyond, we look. I look for my child, and I look for my grandchildren. And I look beyond to my great grandchildren to leave it better than we have it right now. And I know there are other tribes that have put these fifty to hundred year plans together. That I, I know that cities or counties, and they, they just don't. They they, they can't live by being elected four years or put a 30-year career in and retire and move to Arizona or wherever. But we, we're we not going anywhere. This, we're place-based. This is our home. We have to be the ones that's, that say we need to fix it. And um, that's just the way it is. Once in a while, you find people like that'll that'll come on board and go hand-in-hand hand with you because... I just must say they must be like-minded, that they want to leave things better for their children and their grandchildren, regardless of whether they're native or not. And uh, we find a lot of those good partners, a lot of good people out there working with us. In the upper Quinault, we were we knew that we had a multi-hundreds of million dollar project, and we struggled putting our first million and a half together, but as we brought people together and showed them what we were doing really 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 pleased with you know there were people uh ngo out of uh forks washington and you know little fishing clubs and the county had a little bit of money and because there's two counties up there uh, grace harbor and and uh, jefferson you know they 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 came on board and some ngos and uh it's a pleasant surprise to see that there are folks out there working just as hard as we are uh, on on different of these different positions so you know overall I have this um, you know I have this um, you know what I'm talking about is is showing like a big mass population type of a, uh, a view of you know tribes and what's going on but there are a lot of a lot of good folks out there that are working with us to get some of this stuff done. Um, sometimes it's really overwhelming, but uh, when you look at that big question of treaty rights at risk and then that educational point all the time, I mean, there are blogs out there that um, you can get on, and mostly it's all sport fishing and so forth, and it's just negative, 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 and... Uh, It'll really ruin your day, and I have to tell my staff just to stay off there. Do not look at that stuff. Um, I mean, the people that are running those blogs, they have no idea about who we are, 
what our treaty rights are, what our rights are, what our human rights are, uh, and some of the stuff that you see um, on these blogs. So it's it's better not to <laughs> better not to look. But those are the folks that we have to educate, also. Yeah, absolutely. I, I um I like that the uh, the more education that we get to, to do out there, that um, people change their hearts. And uh, I know that with the Nisqually Refuge, you know, the let go of the land. Uh, was it Wilcox that let go? Of the, uh, he need, needed to do it a different way, and it's because of the the dialogue. And I remember. Uh, when I was speaking to Brian Cladisby once, he was saying that we have to work with all those folks, all the 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 businesses all around, and keep educating them and and bringing them into that prayer. And I just wanted to go back a little bit with the squats and powwow. Um, it was extremely healthy; like you could feel it. It was so it was so alive. And folks that missed the uh, coming into uh, squats and territory up here with the canoe journey. Uh, over a hundred canoes coming in down there at Squats and uh, uh, the, uh, the Olympia Port there, Squats and Port to me. But uh, you know, and it's coming up to Quinault uh, this year, and so just wanted to just talk a little bit about you know how the dialogue that that, ha- that ha- happens with the businesses and things like that to to get everybody on board to understand um, to, to see a hundred years down down the road, you know, uh, seven generations. I want to be a good steward here, and I want to do the right thing, and I just educate people about putting things uh, in the drains, you know, that affect us, you know, what uh, what you spray, you know, in, in your yard, things like that. I remember talking to my friend Steve Robinson, and he was like, you just have to go up, and you have to have a nice conversation with your neighbor if they're doing something. You don't have to point any fingers. You just t- tell them, you know, that goes into our watershed, and we're drinking it, and Things like that. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the educational things. Well, tell you, Indian Country grows the best dandelions and moss you ever saw in our yards, because we we're not out there um, throwing that stuff on our yards. And uh, I used to really admire my neighbor Duff Duff Mail Mike Mail. Many uh, folks know that name. He's he was one of our warriors and uh on tribal council and and around the fish commission and he'd be out there and I'd see him doing one method and then pretty soon he's got that one you see on T V where you push the thing in the ground and you pull out the weed and he'd have his whole yard just green and pretty and none of us around there were <laughs> were doing our dandelions. <laughs> About a month later, is all the dandelions in poor Duff's yard. But uh, that's a good point. The, um, there's been a lot of campaigns over time that, and you know, EPA come in and Washington's own ecology and is trying to do the right thing along these watersheds and especially in heavy industrial use like the Duwamish. I mean, what a what a huge task and and a lot of that habitat is. Is and it had been for a long time destroyed, but uh, I see a lot of good things in the Seattle area. You, you know, even city of Seattle trying to put little pieces of habitat back together. But you talk about the ocean and uh, one of the big um, concerns that's being studied and and have grabbed a lot of attention over the last couple of years is acidification. And um, we've learned a lot about acidification in uh, the last year, year and a half. The the state of Washington put together this Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Acidification, and I know uh, a couple of tribal folks were on there uh, on the, I guess it's the committee, and uh, working with the science and looking at the question. And uh, scientists out of the University of Washington, and we had a um, event last July in Washington D.C. for stewards, and uh, we looked at climate, climate change, and um, when we were getting ready for that, a lot of this information was coming out, and I was on a conference call where they could directly link. Um, hypoxia to acidification 
And hypoxia is this event where the lower water column in the ocean gets devoid of oxygen, all the oxygen leaves. And so if you can't get away from that, you, you die. And we had uh, somebody call up the fisheries office and said, you should come down here to Point Granville. We don't know what's going on, but there's fish everywhere. So we rolled on down there, and, and uh, sure enough, there was just a massive fish kill. And it was, there was a little bit of everything, any kind of little, any little and big. There were uh, uh, sea eels, there were different kind of flatfish, including flounder, uh, um, different rockfish, just lined the shore and thick. And so we called up Billy Frank and said, you need to come down here and because we wanted to draw in the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, and we took a lot of took a lot of pictures, and then we started to try to figure out what went on, and so we started to learn about hypoxia. And we'd learned that down off the North Oregon coast, in a and it must be about a 25 mile range, they'd been experiencing that, but that was new to us, and so when after Three or four years later, when they're looking at acidification, when the scientists said we can directly link hypoxia to acidification, that gives me reason to be scared and I'm scared as hell. And this acidification is the carbon that flows down from the air into the ocean, goes to the bottom, and then it does whatever carbon business that is, and then it comes back in through the water. And... Um, they're telling us that that carbon is 50 to 60 years old. So the carbon from 1950 to now or 1960 to now is the carbon that's still down there yet to impact the ocean. And what it does, we know, is does things like um, in oysters, it doesn't give the oysters enough calcium. They don't, they, they don't build their shell right. And... Um, Anything more than that, I'm not really familiar with, but I know that's one of the issues. Is a, it messes with the ability for some of these species to uh, to perpetuate or to grow properly. So we have reason to be concerned about acidification, hypoxia. Um, that makes us makes me really think about when you talk about reducing your carbon footprint you know i think we need to be the leaders personally in indian country we shouldn't have cfc's around we shouldn't have styrofoam we shouldn't have a lot of things and there are a lot of products out there now that are biodegradable all our food service should be that way we should be recycling you know we should be doing a lot of things to reduce that footprint because it's coming back on us. We can't do things the way that we used to do them. We've got to be on that corrective course ourselves. I think uh, what you're saying is it's, it, individually we have to do it as well. Um, anything we could do to to lighten that uh, impact. And uh, I talked to, I, uh, a couple of years back, um, uh, I read that article about um, all the fish coming up on the water and uh i think that's where the uh the famous map came out of that uh, billy carries with them with the dead zones yes. i actually had that map folks uh i got a copy of it and i put it up for one of the events i was doing because uh people need to know the where things are happening and uh i remember talking to billy and i said uh well, what do you said he said people understand dead they don't understand any other stuff so just putting that out there those those areas we're talking about are dead and so they're, which we're trying to um, help them um, recover. Uh, and so these are some of the things that we can do to help them recover, not using pesticides, not using the styrofoam he was talking about. Um, you know, get yourself one of those cups. You don't need to be, you know, I drink a lot of coffee, and I finally got a really nice, at the powwow, I got, I got a really nice cup. And uh, we, we had cups before, but the lids were 
going on. So we went got another one that was well, one of the biggest reasons why we went. And uh, just things like that that we can we can do to uh, to help. And I would love to see it uh, where nobody has to worry about the dandelions and the weeds. And uh, you know, just let it grow. And uh, you know, if you want to trim it, trim it, but you don't have to like spray something on it. So just things, little things like that. And uh, we got about 15 more minutes. I just want to know if there's uh, something that we haven't touched base on that uh, is important that we need to to get out there and uh, to our relatives. And I just uh, uh, first want to just take a moment just to, for myself. I'm a visitor here, and I just appreciate the the tribes allowing myself to be here on the, on the land. And uh, I just uh, want to do as much as I can do uh, to uh, to help with the water and the salmon. I I know that once the salmon go. There, none of us can live here. I know that for a fact. So, I just wanted to see if that's uh, anything on on your heart that, you, that we need to discuss. Well, I I I, um, I wanted to get back to this. Um, the little touch a little bit on the the hypoxia. We we took a look at that, and so we went into our tribe, into our village, and and interviewed folks. And first thing we wanted to know is, are there any stories of any of those events? And we don't find it anywhere in our oral history. And that's that traditional ecological knowledge. That's very important to think about and protect. And our intellectual rights and so forth. Because a lot of these forums that are asking questions now or starting after our knowledge our traditional and ecological knowledge and it has to be a i think a good discussion about how to handle that who owns that property and um a lot of hopefully there's some folks out there in the radio thinking about that because some of the things we're okay to talk about and some of the things we're not okay to talk about are not okay for people to take that knowledge and do with it what they will. But um, I think it it does really start at home, how we treat each, our family, how we treat each other, how we convey the messages of uh, how we want to live, how we how, what we want it to look like. And what's going to be left, you know, um, it really, really makes me hope that we're doing things right for that seventh generation because of the speed of which things are going, the speed of which commerce is happening, the speed of which people are coming into our homelands, and the the population shifts. Um, the tribes really have to work hard. Starting with the family, start with your tribe, start with your local community, start with being involved to protect what we have because I feel really like we got to be on our A game right now. Because we go circle right back to the things that I used to hear post bolt that we had special rights that were different and why should we have this and why should we have that the attack is mounting out there on us um, we gotta really come together and strategize as tribes through the Northwest and through affiliated and through the National Congress to really think about how we're continuing to do that education about who we are and prevent any of the shortcomings that may happen because we've let our guard down. And I've been in the fish business for a long time for all my life in and around the governance or manage of it for over 30 years and <clears throat> I, I don't like what I'm seeing um, there's a continual p 
push to marginalize us and to um, put us in a box, put us in a, show us in a light that, you know, we're portrayed as the bad guys. Um, when I look at the move by the state of Oregon and probably uh, uh, supported by the state of Washington on gillnet bands down in the lower Columbia River, now, that's a non-Indian issue, but it's directed at us. Eventually, it's going to be directed at us. I know that uh, Columbia River tribes, uh, who we've talked to and support, are very concerned, and, and it's really a reallocation issue. It's a reallocation of the non-treaty, the non-Indians, catch. But it will impact us tremendously. And, you know, I can see it coming to the Willapa Harbor and the Grace Harbor, and that, that really concerns me um, because we don't fish the same way as the non-treaty do. Um, the non-treaty want to, in my opinion, put it down to the level of they use a hook and a line, and because they can look at the fish and see whether it has an adipose clip or whether it's hatchery fish or wild, they claim to have, um, you know, less impact. But there are a lot of unknowns about the impacts because the studies, they some that they did do and some that they didn't do, and commitments towards the co-managers of that resource. So that's one example of where I'm really not comfortable with where we are in this 2013 and working with the co-manager and I really feel it in other areas that over here they want us to agree and then over here they're opposing us and they're opposing us and they're opposing us and they're opposing us and so I look over here and say why the hell are we agreeing over here because over here hunting they're opposing us access they're opposing us uh, one thing that impacts the fishing, then over here, their law enforcement are trying to regulate our fishermen, opposing us, opposing us, opposing us. I go back to the other side and say, well, then why are we agreeing over here? If we're going to fight, everything's on the table. So um, do you find that the tribes, like uh, I know I, I was reading an article about Skokomish, uh, how they're uh, suing the state of Washington for the hunting rights. Uh, do you find that that's going to, that uh, the tribes have to, that's what you're talking about on your game, where they have to, they're constantly, they have to be, oh my God, something's coming around the corner. Um, this is what I have to do. You find that, and I know that's happening in Chehalis too with the warehouser, I believe, and a few others down there that don't want the tribes to, to hunt on their custom in places that they've been doing f before anybody got here. Mm -hmm. Um, do you find you find that that that's happening? Yeah, I think that. I mean, I, I I would admit though that I don't. I'm not up to speed with that part of the hunting right now. But that's part of the tactic, you know, divide and conquer. You know, we'll do this over in this area, and then we'll do another thing over in that area. I mean, that's that's even more present now than it ever was. Um, so, so that requires us tribes to communicate, get in our forum, work things out amongst ourselves, and then we know how to deal with the other side of that. And, uh, you know, in the, in the hunting part, again, which I'm, I'm just kind of on the fringes of, but I know they go back to a couple other prior court cases. I do know that uh, I saw a, a proposed bill, and I don't know where it ended up, where they were talking, uh, one legislator put it out there, for DNR lands to, and this was access under the open and gun claims where they're trying to restrict us under open and gun claims. And uh, with a bill, I'm hoping that it went through, and I probably should be talking to Steve Robinson or someone like that, uh, that was um, to, to open those DNR lands, open the access for us or to us um, where they're 
states preventing us from being able to access those lands. So it is more than ever we have to be together and work these things out. The tribes do before, and then the, with the Skokomish piece, I'm just really not up to speed on what that one was, but uh, I can't say enough about working together before these things escalate where you're um, pitting tribes against tribes. But in this case, I don't know what that that really leads to because I didn't read it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm myself uh, trying to find out more, but I also know just from my little experience with um, uh, being a part of certain things, I know like the Squatch Island have a huge uh, – um, they with Bud Inlet and how to clean it up. They, they know they have – I read the plan, and it's extensive, it will work. Mm. And we know that it will because of Nisqually. But I remember, um, uh, I think it was a year, maybe maybe a little over a year, that uh, Billy was out of town, I think he was out of the country. And they tried to sneak, the uh, state, of, state of Washington tried to sneak in this uh, um, bill that would prevent any talk about it again. And thank God for McCoy, uh, Representative McCoy, he was there who vetoed it right away. We were concerned about it as uh, um, people will, here. We have a little group that uh, wants to see um, that area restored, um, get rid of that lake. It's filthy. It's disgusting. Uh, uh, it needs to be dealt with, and the, the tribes know what to do. And it's like it goes back to what you said earlier. And I again, I have my references go to Billy because I always hear him in the back of my head. And uh, you know, we've always lived on these watersheds. We know these watersheds, and we're not going anywhere. And you need to start listening to us. And uh, I, I find that uh, that that piece, I, I got a little bit of what you what you've probably experienced your whole life. You know, with uh, constantly having to uh, these underhanded dealings. I, I, I that's all I'll say. Yeah. Well, thank God we have Billy. You know, I'm I'm fortunate to. Uh, worked with him for a long time and in particular i don't know if it's six or eight or ten years now we traveled a lot together and a lot of breakfasts and dinners and cab rides and a couple of inaugurations and uh we were sitting uh we were invited by the white house to the i can't remember what the official ball name was but eventually there were thirty five thousand people in there and <clears throat> we're sitting down in this place we were invited it was real there was only maybe a hundred people in there in private and uh billy looks around and he goes geez we're the only darn indians in here he said <laughs> and then and then we're treated to a real treat with the leisha keys and the, the president and all that that came about and uh was really pretty fantastic but great mentor um look up to him greatest amount of respect as I would for Joe Dela Cruz and my brother Guy and all my leaders from Quinault right down the line. Thank you for the opportunity here. Yeah. That's what I say. Billy uh, is quite poetic. He's the only person I know that could uh, swear and get away with it, folks. <laughs> and it sounds so beautiful. I, I know that you are, you know that. And uh, I just, uh, as a little kid, I've always, uh, I, I, I grew up in uh, upstate New York, Aquasasini area. The, the colonials call it Augensburg, New York, but it's Aquasasini. And I have lots of friends in the, the res area. And everywhere I go, they know Billy. They know who, who he is, what he's done. Um, and I just, I myself just appreciate uh, Billy and uh, the Northwest. Uh, Indian Fish Commission, because uh, a lot of the, what I share comes from them, and uh, they're um, amazing resources. They're open door policy, uh, and Billy is uh, one of those people. If he met you once, that's all it takes. He and he doesn't forget you. And uh, I just I, and I appreciate you taking time tonight to share with us. It's very important for us to um, take care of the water. I, uh, we got water in all four directions here, and I know that it needs our help. And uh, I, I I'm, I'm I'm listening. Yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, opportunity, and uh, go Chitwins. We hope to go to Spokane, take care of business, and uh, always good to be here on the campus of Evergreen State.